uh, two in-person panelists and one virtual for this particular session. Uh, the format we're going to follow, and I should probably introduce myself as well, I'm Tyler Pitroff. I'm the class of 1957 postdoctoral fellow here at the Naval Academy. Uh, I'm in my second year. Uh, Dr. Roger Bailey, who's actually hosting another panel, is the incoming class of 57 postdoctoral. Uh, as you remember from the first panel, I'm sure, uh, we will present first. I will offer some comments, and then we'll open the floor to questions afterwards. Um, Ensign Calvalli here is going to help us on the digital end, and he will be reading questions for you virtual folks. I don't, we don't particularly want to make anyone else talk other than Glenn. Uh, so if you have a question, there should be a button in the bottom right of your screen you can click on, and there is a Q&A button there where you can type what you would like to ask, and we will ask them in the order we get them. <clears throat> okay? Okay, so now that we have that open. So first off, we have... Captain Jamie McGrath, uh, who is retired from the U.S. Navy as of 2019 after 29 years of service as a nuclear trained uh, service warfare officer. Excuse me. He is now the director of the Major General W. Thomas Rice Center for Leader Development at Virginia Tech and an adjunct professor in the U.S. Naval War College's College of Distance Education. Pretty relevant at this point in time. Passionate about using history to inform today, his area of focus is U.S. Naval history, 1919 to 1945, with emphasis on the interwar period. He holds a bachelor's in history from Virginia Tech, a master's in national security and strategic studies from the U.S. Naval War College, and a master's in military history from Norwich University. All right, thank you. Um, I will admit uh, I will be a little bit intimidated because uh, I, when you say interwar period and I see Dr. Hone here, uh, <laughs> I've, I've probably referenced pretty much everything he's written in my, in my studies of the interwar period, but I'm going to talk today a little bit uh, not about the interwar, but uh, Nimitz's operations uh, in the early portion of the first or the Second World War in the Pacific. So after the initial shock, uh, slide please. After the initial shock of Pearl Harbor wore off and the Asiatic fleet was chased out of the South China Sea, the U.S. Navy began deliberately attempting to recover what had been lost. Between May and August of 1942, the United States Navy fought three major naval battles in the Pacific, Coral Sea, Midway, and Saddle Island. The results of these battles ran the spectrum from unprecedented victory to spectacular defeat, but the impact of all three was essentially the same. Each battle contributed to the Americans moving forward with their operational effort to blunt Imperial Japanese Navy expansion. How could a win, Midway, a loss, Savile Island, and a draw, Coral Sea, all be American operational victories? The definition of victory in military operations is not as clear as the casual observer, observer might imagine. In land combat, the army that holds the field at the end of the battle is generally considered the victor. In naval warfare, however, when both sides return to their bases, holding the field is a poor metric for victory. Another metric could be the side that inflicted greater losses on the opponent, or conversely, the least for, lost the least forces of its own. This metric appears more relevant for naval engagement, but does not necessarily reveal the whole story. The Mahanian tradition of a decisive battle being the most effective me mechanism for gaining command of the seas would indicate that naval combat would provide a clear-cut winner, the one whose fleet remains capable of operating or commanding the sea. But what happens when naval combat is something less than decisive? How are battles deemed successful or not when only fractions of opposing fleets are engaged? Operational art provides insight into how less than decisive naval actions can be viewed from a broader perspective of major operations and campaigns that aim to to objectives larger than a single tactical action. Slide, please. According to naval theorist Milan Vago, operational art is the only means of orchestrating and tying together tactical actions within a large design that directly contributes to the objective set by strategy. Note that Vago's statement does not say tactical victories, only tactical actions. The American strategy in 1942 was Europe first, thereby making the Pacific a secondary theater and favoring an attritional campaign against the Japanese. Admiral Chester W. Nimitz's operational idea supporting this strategy was to engage when given an opportunity to have local advantage, where something he referred to as calculated risk. As the commander in chief of the Pacific Fleet, Nimitz knew that eventually he would need to defeat the Imperial Japanese Navy in order to win the war, but 1942 was not the time to achieve that goal. With a numerically inferior force, Nimitz could not engage in a decisive naval battle against the Japanese combined fleet with any real hope of victory. Instead, his operational idea was to maximize the use of forces he had available while exercising calculated risk to attrite the Japanese Navy wherever possible. 
By concentrating his forces and relying on excellent intelligence, Nimitz was able to pick his battles and engage portions of the Japanese fleet where the odds were closer to even. Since his goal was attrition, Nimitz was not dependent on winning these contests, but instead inflicting maximum damage on the Japanese. It was not about tactical victories, but instead about deliberate tactical actions within the larger operational design. Much has been written about Nimitz's idea of calculated risk. Most famously, he sent the supplemental guidance to Rear Admirals Fletcher and Spruance as they sailed towards Point Luck, northeast of Midway in late May of 42. He wrote, quote, you will be governed by the principles of calculated risk, which you shall interpret to mean the avoidance of exposure of your force to attack by superior enemy forces without prospect of inflicting, as a result of such exposure, greater damage to the enemy. Nimitz not, was not seeking decisive tactical victories, but instead to inflict proportional to greater damage with every engagement. He had definitely applied this commander, the commander's estimate of the situation, which was the inner war precursor to what we now call operational art, in the first year of the Pacific War, demonstrating that the purpose of his tactical actions was to advance his operational strategic objectives, not to win the war in a single battle. Uh, he was, Nimitz was determined, as was his boss, Admiral King, to take advantage when opportunity was given. Recognizing that a direct report was impossible with the balance of power in the Pacific heavily favoring the Japanese, Nimitz accepted calculated risk and took opportunities when they arose. He, posed, he possessed some notable advantages. One such advantage was the freedom of action afforded to him by his superiors. Despite a reputation for meddling in the Pacific operations, King usually allowed Nimitz to pursue his operational idea, especially as the war progressed. Nimitz was also able to shield his subordinates from interference, which might have impacted their ability to fight battles. Another critical advantage was the American cryptologist had broken the Japanese naval code and were reading significant portions of Japanese naval message traffic. Cryptology was not a crystal ball or an exact science, but combined with other intelligence, Nimitz's team was able to garner reasonable pictures of Japanese operations that spring and summer. And using this information, Nimitz was able to move his forces into advantageous positions to execute his principle of calculated risk. It remained the officer and tactical command's task to fight the battles once joined, but since Nimitz was not dependent on winning any one action, the battles themselves, regardless of the results, served to advance the operational goal of attracting Japanese naval strength. Slide. Oops, I missed the slide. So there's calculated risk. <laughs> okay. Um, Examining the naval actions mentioned above in chronological order, one can see how each moved the operational goal forward. The Battle of Coral Sea was a tactical draw. Nimitz's intelligence team determined that the Japanese were planning to seize Port Moresby and New Guinea, Operation MO, to threaten the vital U.S.-Australian sea lines of communication. To counter this, Nimitz sent his only available carriers, Fletcher's Task Force 16, centered around USS Lexington and USS Yorktown, to confront the Japanese. Committing Task Force 16 was a risky gambit since this represented these rep carriers represented exactly half of the inventory of combat-ready carriers in the Pacific and a third of the total American carrier inventory. But Nimitz's intelligence team provided reasonable information that Task Force 16 roughly equaled the size of the Japanese invasion force, so he determined that the calculated risk was worth the effort. The ensuing battle resulted in losses on both sides. The Japanese force inflicted substantial damage on Fletcher's carriers, sinking Lexington and severely damaging Yorktown, with heavy losses to the American air wings. In return, Fletcher's avi aviators famously were able to scratch one flat top, the light carrier Shoho, grievously damage the heavier carrier Shou uh, Shokuku, and decimate the air group of the heavy carrier Zuikaku. Apologize for my Japanese carrier pronunciation. The tactical measure, uh, it sounds like I'm in the stage. By the tactical measure of victory being the force that inflicted most damage, Corvado Force C was essentially a draw. But battlefield losses are not necessarily the same as operational losses. Fletcher's actions forced the Japanese to call off the Port Moresby operation, removing the imminent threat to the U.S.-Australian sea lines of communication. The Americans had won an immediate operational victory. But more critical to Nimitz's operational idea was the relative loss in carriers. Shokuku and Zuikaku were slated to participate in the upcoming Midway operation, and Japanese overconfidence made the restoration of these two carriers to, to service a low priority and therefore they were kept from joining Operation MI on schedule because they wanted to keep Operation MI on schedule. Contrarily, the American carrier losses were high relative to the total carrier strength, and since Nimitz understood the importance of putting every available carrier into operation, uh, after limping into port on the 27th of May, Pearl Harbor Navy Shipyard put in Herculean effort to repair Yorktown, getting her back to sea in three days instead of the predicted three months. The Americans were also able to replace Yorktown's depleted air group with the air, with air group three from the damaged Saratoga, allowing Yorktown to depart in time for the Battle of Midway with a full complement of aircraft. 
Thus, a tactical draw of Coral Sea helped even the odds for the next series of engagements north of Midway Island, making Coral Sea an operational victory for Nimitz and marking the end of what King characterized as the defensive phase of Pacific War. Slide. <clears throat> the American victory at Midway has been the subject of many books and documentaries, so it will not be rehashed here, but at Midway we see a relatively clear-cut American victory that in hindsight marked the high watermark of the Japanese Navy's war effort. Nimitz did not, however, know this for sure at the time. Japanese losses at Midway were four heavy carriers and their air groups and one heavy cruiser. And that left the Japanese with the, their two newest heavy carriers, albeit still recovering from the Battle of Coral Sea, and five light carriers still operational in addition to the entirety of the combined fleet's heavy surface forces. With the loss of Yorktown, Nimitz possessed only two, soon to be three, operational heavy carriers in the, in, in, and no light carriers. The Japanese still outnumbered the Americans in carrier firepower despite the severe losses at Midway. And, remaining do and remained dominant in surface ships. A fundamental difference, however, was what was coming in the next year. There were 11 heavy carriers and six light carriers under construction in American shipyards in June of 42, compared to zero in Japan. So despite the momentary near parity in car carrier forces, both Yamamoto and Nimitz knew that soon would change in favor of the United States. The Battle of Midway provides an important lesson about how tactical actions, regardless of their outcome, influence strategic objectives. When tactical actions do not align with strategic objectives, they are at best wasteful of blood and treasure and at worst detrimental to the strategy they are intended to support. As Vago writes, poor application of operational art can lead to tactical defeats, which in turn may have not only operational but strategic consequences. For example, the combined fleet suffered decisive defeat in the Battle of Midway because of a flawed operational plan. This example provides perhaps best demonstrates how the superiority of one's forces could easily be squandered when operational thinking on the part of the operational commanders is inadequate or entirely lacking. Nimitz, in contrast, exemplified clear operational thinking. Naval historian Craig Simons, who I'm glad is not in the room right now, <laughs> called the Battle of Midway. <laughs> and, uh, thanks. He's read the paper, so. Um, he, he called the Battle of Midway one of the most consequential naval ga uh, engagements in world history, ranking alongside Sal Salamis, Trafalgar, and Tsushima Strait. Those, that's not a that's not a controversial statement. However, uh, but the tactical victory was less important than the American participation in the battle that the, than the fact that the battle aligned with Nimitz's operational idea. Defending Midway was not the operational objective. Had Nimitz not held the advantage of superior intelligence, Simon surmises that Nimitz would have ceded Midway to the Japanese. It was not worth a, worth risking his forces to defend. But knowing that the tactical action in the waters north of Midway pitted nearly equal forces, four Japanese carriers against three American carriers in Midway Island, the most likely result was the attrition of Japanese force. Had the results at Midway not been so tactically decisive, committing the whole of the American carrier force to the battle still aligned with Nimitz's operational idea of continuing to attrite the Japanese Navy at every opportunity, guided by his principles of calculated risk. The action at Midway marked the end of the defensive offensive period phase of the war in the Pacific and allowed Nimitz to more clearly begin offensive operations in the South Pacific. Slide. Fought just two months after America's most celebrated naval victory, Savo Island was perhaps the United States Navy's worst maritime defeat. Yet even in defeat, with the Japanese failure to capitalize on their tactical victory, Savo Island served to advance Nimitz's operational idea. The American invasion was a shoestring operation that took, or a Guadalcanal was a shoestring operation that took advantage of an overextended Japanese position. Like Fort Moresby, like the Fort Moresby operation, potential Japanese control of an airfield at Guadalcanal threatened the vital U.S.-Australian sea lines of communication. Seizing an opportunity on the 7th of August, 1942, the Americans landed the 1st Marine Division at Guadalcanal with no opposition from the defending Japanese garrison. The Battle of Savo Island occurred less than two days later when Admiral Makawa's force of heavy cruisers and destroyers attacked an Allied cruiser destroyer force commanded by Rear Admiral Crutchley, Royal Navy. The ta resulting tactical action was a disaster for the Allies. Makawa's cruisers sank four Allied cruisers and severely damaged a fifth against minor damage to three of his ships. After soundly defeating the Allied force, Makawa withdrew to his home base at Rabaul without attacking the vulnerable logistics ships still unloading onto the Guadalcanal beachhead for fear of being caught by American air power. Although the outcome of the two uh, allied for the for the two allied cruiser formations of Sealark Channel was devastating, the night action off Savo Island served its purpose in screening the American invasion force in Sealark Sound, soon to be renamed Iron Bottom Sound. In another example of 
a Japanese commander not recognizing the operational impact of tactical actions, Mikawa's plan from the outset was to fight a decisive action with the American fleet, its surface combatants, not the logistics ships supporting the building buildup of forces on shore. Thus, despite his annihilation of the Allied screening force, Mikawa failed to force the withdrawal of American forces on Guadalcanal. The very fact that the surf American surface force was present forced Mikawa to engage it instead of the vulnerable logistics shipping anchored just off the invasion beaches. Thus, a tactical defeat turned into an operational direct, direct victory, or more correctly, Mikawa's operational victory was squandered without operational success. While the action off Savo Island differed in two significant aspects from the previous two, aside from the disastrous outcome, it still served Nimitz's operational purpose. The battles of Coral Sea and Midway were deliberate in that Nimitz sent his force to the scene with the intent of engaging the enemy force. They also each involved measured offensive action by carrier aircraft against the opposing force. Savo Island was entirely a surface action and altogether defensive for the Americans. It was, however, part of a larger phase of the Pacific War that King characterized as offensive-defensive operations. The seizure of Guadalcanal itself, a tactical action of America's choosing, allied with Nimitz's operational idea as it had evolved over the preceding three months. And despite the tactically defensive loss at Savo Island and subsequent withdrawal of Fletcher's carriers, the Marines remained ashore on Guadalcanal and the Cactus Air Force continued to operate from Henderson Field on the operational offensive. Unthinkable in early 1942, the tactical actions in May and June helped level the playing field that made Operation Watchtower possible. Slide. The tactical actions that followed uh, Savo Island, four more major night surface actions in, in and around Iron Bottom Sound, and two carrier actions on the broader ocean spaces north and east of Salem Island, each contributed to the American operational idea, which had evolved to include steady pressure against the Japanese. None of these tactical actions were in and of themselves decisive. Nor were, there clear back, nor were they clear tactical victories for either side. But each of these battles prevented the Japanese from adequately reinforcing their garrison on Guadalcanal and contributed to the broader operational objective of preventing the use of, of Guadalcanal by the Japanese. The Japanese were forced to make increasingly more desperate attempts to defend Guadalcanal, eventually ceding the island to the Americans six months to the day after the American invasion. No one likes losing. But winning is not everything, provided the tactical actions align with the operational idea. It is how a commander responds to the outcome that matters more than the outcome itself. In the opening months of the war in the Pacific, Admiral Nimitz understood this, not seeking decisive battle of the, th of the old through ticket plan, but instead exercising an idea of calculated risk. The Japanese, on the other hand, failed to recognize that attri the attritional nature of the Pacific War and continued to seek decisive battle, believing the destruction of the enemy fleet as a guarantor of sea control. Picking his battles and taking advantage of the results to, the advantage of his, uh, to advance his operational approach, Nimitz was able to take a range of tactical outcomes, a win, a loss, and a draw, and transform them into operational victories that forced the Japanese from a strategic offensive to strategic defensive over a span of four months, despite being outnumbered and outgunned. Thank you. All right, our next speaker is our virtual panelist. Uh, and, and Glenn, I have to apologize, I did not ask how to pronounce your last name. Siegel? Uh, yeah, you can pronounce it uh, as you wish, really. Um, I think different people have different uh, ears anyway, so Siegel is fine by me. Well, thank you. Uh, Glenn Siegel, DPhil FRGS, is a research fellow at the University of the Free State South Africa and at the University of Haifa, Israel. He was born in South Africa and educated to a BA and MA at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem and to a Doctor of Philosophy at the University of Oxford. He specializes in intelligence studies, civil military relations, the nexus between air and sea power, and strategic communications, where he also consults as an expert for NATO. Oh, excuse me. <laughs> uh, intelligence studies, civil military relations, and nexus between... Hmm, yeah, that must have gotten copied wrong. Well, he also consults as an expert for NATO. He has held teaching and research positions in the United Kingdom, Israel, and South Africa. These issues, uh, these include the Center for D Defense Studies at King's College London, the University of Reading, the Institute for National Security Studies Tel Aviv, and the Urzai Center for Iran and Gulf St uh, States Research, University of Haifa. He holds the rank of Brigadier General Reserves. He was involved in active intelligence and offensive operations in Iraq, Kuwait, Sudan, and Libya. 
He has published a substantial number of peer-reviewed articles and books. And today he is presenting to us the Royal Navy's ballistic missile submarines, which of course, as you are all I'm sure aware, very topical to what's currently going on in the news. <laughs> but Glenn, go ahead. Thank you very much for that uh, introduction and good afternoon to everyone uh, on site and online. I've called it uh, SSBN, but in the Royal Navy there is uh, a different numbering system, but we'll get to that as we go through it. Um, if I'm actually looking at a summary of everything that I'm going to be saying today, um, we can summarize it in a few words. There's invention, which is the nuclear propulsion and nuclear submarine uh, ballistic missile launches, of which there's only seven countries which can do that. So both of those have been very topical this month, the nuclear propulsion, because Australia is in line to get it, and the SLBM, because South Korea is the seventh country in the world to have tested one of those and launched that. So both of those are in the headlines. We can also have a key word called innovation, because it's a special Anglo-American relationship, and it's a two-way street, as we're going to see most important for us as naval historians is the longevity in history. We are talking about now a track record of from the 1950s to the present, but there's agreements and also disagreements in both domestically as well as in that international relationship between the United States and the United Kingdom and their alternatives which has led to that disagreement. If I want to summarize this in terms of history and naval power, we can say that submarines are very, very much involved more in deterrence as an element of defense rather than active defense. That means for all intents and purposes, national security is more important than naval sea power. If we have to look at the history of submarines since the end of the Second World War, I can say we have only two instances once when uh, Her Majesty's ship Conqueror took down the Argentinian destroyer in May 1982, and the second one was uh, Pakistan diesel, Hangor took off a uh, Indian anti-submarine frigate. So there's only two instances ever since uh, the end of the Second World War where submarines have actually been used in naval power. Of course, there's uh, the cruise missile launches, for example, during the first Gulf War by the United States, Pittsburgh and Louisville. So national security has a more overriding strategic element than the tactical naval sea power. Um, looking at innovation and invention, we can see that um, invention refers to the creation and innovation is the adaptation of that. So I want to introduce something more than just a narrative of the Royal Navy submarines, but look at it more in terms of the deeper decision-making process. Um, technology and transfer adaptation, that was one of many, many projects in the special relationship between the two countries, and some of them were very much naval orientated. For example, the AV-8A and B, the Harrier aircraft, jump jets, and uh, we can say to an extent uh, F-35Cs, which are going on right now. Let's take a look at three different generations of uh, SLBM and uh, the related platforms. So we have Polaris, we have the MIRVs, and we have Trident. And the MIRVs are very important because the Chevlin version, which is the British version, was a deciding factor not to have Poseidon. So we have Polaris, Chevlin, MIRV, and Trident, and we don't have Polaris Poseidon and Trident. Let's get into more depth now in terms of the SSBN. Uh, we can actually learn a lot about American naval history by looking at the Royal Navy's SSBN. And uh, we can say for all intents and purposes that uh, the Royal Navy, United Kingdom, is the only American ally for the last 63 years to have had that technology, nuclear propulsion and the missiles. And Australia is now next in line. And this is, if we're looking at the historical uh, progression, Truman and Attlee, the 46th McMahon Act was closing the door. Rick Hover, Admiral Hickover, and Lord Mountbatten was the propulsion agreement. Uh, President Eisenhower and uh, Prime Minister Macmillan was the deciding 1950 uh, mutual defense agreement. And then uh, President Kennedy and Secretary of Defense McNamara and Prime Minister McMillan was the deciding 1962 Polaris Agreement after Skybolt was cancelled. And then we're moving forward into the second generation, Nixon-Ford uh, 
presidencies with Prime Minister Heath and the disagreement, which was Merv and not Poseidon. And then, of course, the latest, which is President Carter and Reagan and Prime Minister Thatcher over Trident. So it's a longevity of history in terms of that. Looking a bit into the background, we see that uh, the United Kingdom was the third nuclear power in the world and could have gone ahead by its own right in uh, getting this uh, nuclear propulsion, as well as uh, a missile-based system, but there were deciding factors to speed it up, not the least being cost. And one of which was the fact that air defenses were actually going to be vulnerable. So we find that in the post-Second World period, very important to say that essentially anything which was airborne was vulnerable, and we had to go seaward and submarine in order to ensure a very viable deterrence as an active and passive defense. And we find in the United Kingdom's instance from 1998, the only platform which uh, is nuclear is in fact the submarines, the SSBN, compared to the United States, which still has uh, land to land, surface to surface and airborne. So there's a bit of a difference there in terms of strategy as well. Let's look at the actual submarines themselves. We find that 1954 was a, a very important key point and turning point because it was the United States Navy's first nuclear power submarine and then Nautilus. And at this point, uh, the McMahon Act was still in force. So the technology could not legally uh, be transferred outside of the United States. And I often say the McMahon Act was, uh, in fact, the first uh, non-proliferation treaty domestically as well as internationally. The United States restrained itself from giving anybody a nuclear technology, whatever the case would be. We have Admiral Rickover and Lord Mountbatten, and they didn't agree with each other whatsoever. Uh, for personal reasons, uh, they were, in fact, born on the exact same day uh, in the same year. So they were exact same age. But uh, Rickover had a very personal issue with Mountbatten over the relationship of uh, um, the Mountbatten, the royal family, with the Tsars. And Rickover's family, of uh, uh, his ancestors, faced uh, persecution from the same Tsars. And a deciding very, very important book to read to see how uh, Rickover and how Mountbatten reconciled was The Role of Scientists, written by Solly Zuckerman. And Solly Zuckerman was Britain's... Uh, chief scientific advisor, and he uh, broke the ice and got them together again. The 1958 Mutual Defense Agreement enabled the transfer of nuclear propulsion technology. And so we find that by 1960, a very second important turning point was George Washington, the first Polaris launch, the first SLBM launch using a nuclear uh, warhead. Um, how did Britain come to get this? Well, we still had this alternative was air to surface uh, standoff missiles, the Skybolt, and Kennedy actually canceled that uh, in November 1962 because of vulnerability of the aircraft. And if we have to take this historically, we can say it, November 1962 is immediately after the Cuban Missile Crisis. So we can put this in context of what was happening as well. And Kennedy said, I can't find any rationale to have airborne systems anymore. What did this do for Britain? Well, Britain was going to get the Skybolt. And that basically meant that Britain's nuclear deterrence no longer existed. Uh, McNamara also did not wish to transfer any technology uh, over to the United Kingdom. He wanted any technology or any weapons to have a dual key. In other words, Washington would help the Pentagon would have a deciding use of it. Um, very interestingly, uh, Prime Minister Macmillan invited President Kennedy to uh, the Bermudas to NASA. So this uh, agreement did not take place as usual in Camp David or in Washington. It took place in a uh, British uh, colonial uh, island off uh, of the Caribbean. And there it was agreed to transfer the Polaris missiles. Uh, but the independent part was Britain would develop its own warheads for that. And so uh, HMS Draudnaught, S-101, it's not a SSBN or SSGN or SSN clarification. The United Kingdom has different clarifications, but for all terms and purposes, this is a SSN. And this was the first nuclear reactor transferred from Westinghouse to Rolls-Royce Company. And it led to the resolution class of nuclear ballistic submarines with Polaris missiles. If we have a little bit of a recap on the chronology of this, uh, the United States, George Washington, July 62, November six, uh, 60, sorry, November 62, Skybolt air to surface cancelled. 
uh, December 62, the Nasser Agreement between Kennedy and Clinton from Polaris. 63, the missiles provided to Britain. And 68, the first generation of SSBN, the resolution, enters uh, the Royal Navy service. And from 82 to 96, it was upgraded with the Chevlin MIRVs. What is a MIRV? Well, for all intents and purposes, it was believed that uh, the anti-missile defenses around Washington would be able to down any incoming missile. So a MIRV has multiple warheads or decoys, which enables at least one to get through. And technologically, we're looking at the second generation, 1982, which was the Trident missiles. And in 1993, the second generation of platform, which is a Vanguard SSBN, but also still using the Trident. And we're now moving into the third generation, which is a Dreadnought class, but also with Trident. And for all intents and purposes, the Dreadnought and uh, the Trident teaches a lot about the United States Navy's Ohio class because it's the same missile with the same compartment. But there are differences, and this is the difference between innovation and invention. Um, according to the Royal Corps of Naval Constructions, uh, Mr. Daniel, the Royal Navy uh, Resolution class possessed five features that were envied by the United States Navy. In other words, uh, the Royal Navy had actually adapted and learned from that. And these are the five on the screen at the moment. So there was a slight improvement over the system. Of course, the MIRVs um, was a different agreement because um, this was going to be a United Kingdom solely based system and there would be no procurement of the Poseidon, which is what the United States wanted. Um, when we're looking at the second generation, the Trident missiles, this was very much a Thatcher and Reagan. As we know from our history, they were very close and uh, had a lot of agreements and so forth. However, there was a disagreement internally. A lot of uh, Thatcher's own conservative Tory party disagreed over the procurement of the Trident. They believed already in the 1980s, there was no need for uh, nuclear based any form of deterrence. Uh, if we're looking at the second generation, this is the Vanguard class of the SSBN, and we learn a lot when we study that about the United States Navy's Ohio class, which is the current service. And uh, the Vanguard was the first generation uh, designed from the onset as SSBN. If we're now looking at the third generation, uh, we find that there is more than just uh, the five features of the previous one. We look at a hull made of composite acrylic and powered by a fusion reactor. And this was uh, the part of the two-way street going back to the United States. The United States uh, Navy really envied and needed technology from the United Kingdom about silencing. And this was important so uh, the United States uh, submarines wouldn't be detected. The agreement and disagreement goes as far as saying how much is enough. The United Kingdom has only ever had four SSBNs at any given time, and four they believe is enough. One on station, one going to station, one under repair, one in training or reserve. And uh, the United States, as we know, uh, believes uh, far more than just that. There's also an issue in terms of threat perception, and we can get uh, an entire analysis in terms of what is the national security role of a SSBN compared to the sea power role when you only have four, or compared to the United States when you have well over uh, the 10 into the 20. We also have a difference of opinion in terms of the number of warheads. So we find if we had to look down the screen, we find that the United Kingdom never really had, even though it had the capability with four SSBNs to have 196 warheads, I didn't believe that there was enough uh, targets to ever have more than around 50. And very interestingly this year, uh, Prime Minister Boris Johnson has just raised that cap uh, of potential from 196 to 260, which is going to lead us into a lot of uh, speculation of just how and where they're going to be deployed. Looking at SSBN and naval power, we see, as I started off talking about the relationship between uh, defense and deterrence, we see that SSBN serve little, if any, role against other vessels in sea power. However, the submarine and the crew are provide more service to their country and communities than any other weapon system. That's one of the few, maybe the only, of guaranteeing a nuclear second strike capability and they're paramount for deterrence. And we see the relationship between the United States and the United Kingdom, between the United States Navy and the Royal Navy through the SSBN, both in terms of invention and innovation.
And there's no no near twin pulpit uh, if we have to go into nuclear strategy, for example, second strike capability. So um, just to draw things to a conclusion in terms of looking at the longevity, invention, innovation, and other weapon systems. And there were many, many other weapon systems uh, also being involved in the special relationship between the two countries, both naval as well as aviation, and definitely intelligence. Uh, GCHQ and the United uh, States uh, comparatives um, were open door between each other. And until last week, really, Britain has been the only of all of America's allies that has been privileged to receive uh, the advice and technology on submarine nuclear propulsion. Uh, Australia's next in line 63 years later. And only seven countries, uh, as of last month, it was only six, with uh, South Korea joining the club last month as well regarding the submarine launch ballistic mm -hmm. missiles. And uh, I could say the contribution of what I'm really looking at in terms of all my research is to look at the links between the USN and the RN and the longevity, uh, in other words, the historical line of decades. And uh, that insists us in learning about decision making between different leaders and, and different uh, technical teams and so forth. And uh, I'll stop at that point. Thank you very much. All right, our final speaker is Stephen C. Wills. Stephen Wills is an expert in U.S. Navy strategy and policy and U.S. Navy surface warfare programs and platforms with the Center for Naval Analysis. His research interests include the history of U.S. Navy strategy development over the Cold War and immediate <coughs> post-Cold War era, and the history of post-World War II U.S. Navy service forces. Prior to joining CNA, while completing his Ph.D. in military history from Ohio University, he had a 20-year career as an active duty U.S. Navy officer. He served on a variety of small and medium surface combatants, including an assignment as the executive officer of a mine countermeasure ship and held shore-based billets at the Defense Intelligence Agency, the, non, the, excuse me, the Joint Non-Lethal Weapons Directorate, and at NATO Joint Forces Command, Naples, Italy. He is the author of Strategy Shell, The Collapse of Cold War Naval Strategic Planning, published by the Naval Institute Press, which I believe is upstairs on the table if you're interested in it, and co-author with former Navy Secretary John Lehman, of Where Are the Carriers, U.S. National Strategy, and the Choices Ahead, published by Foreign Policy Research Institute earlier this month. Wills' articles have appeared in the United States Naval War College Review, the United States Naval Institute News, RealClearDefense.com, Simsec.org, WarOnTheRocks.com, and InformationDissemination.net. He has delivered presentations at Center for International Maritime Security events, and Wills holds a Ph.D. and M.A. in History, as I said, from Ohio University, an MA in National Security Studies from the United States Naval War College, and a BA in History from Miami University, Oxford, Ohio. Tyler, thank you so very much for that very kind introduction. You folks don't mind, I can't talk to this, so if you are okay with that, I'll put it back on. Okay. It's, oh, it's, sir, I'm just horribly offended and can't live. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Sorry. Well, it's it's like what I try and teach my my 15 year old now about dating and so forth. There's you have there's consent things and so <laughs> forth. So you, you have to talk to people and get their consent. So, again, um, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so very much. Um, today I'm going to talk about CNO visions, uh, and hopefully this will be an interesting topic for all of us. But first, let me say that nothing I have to say here necessarily reflects the opinions of my employer, the Center for Naval Analyses, or the United States Navy. These are my own concepts. And okay, visions of glory. Well, as I start in my paper, uh, William Manchester's uh, first book in the Churchill series is called Visions of Glory. And I think sometimes uh, when you read back and look at what's written about CNO visions in the past from some of these gentlemen that you see here, that there's a search for some vision of glory that's going to last and endure long beyond their their tenure. Uh, as we heard in the panel this morning, uh, I can't remember if it was either Ed Morolda or Tom Hone saying CNOs bending the bureaucracy to reflect their vision. And you've only got four years to do this. So it's important to look at these visions. At CNA, I have to do methodological research. So there ought to be some sort of methodology to my study. So what is that? Well, we know as historians like to reperiodize history. So we'll try and look at things through a different set of dates 
or combination of personages over time in order to find patterns or things that are unexpected. So that's the methodology uh, behind this. Uh, so let's move to the next slide. Please. Excellent. Okay. So this is sort of my executive summary slide. But before that, we have to ask, what is the CNO vision? And, and it varies from admiral to admiral over time. I couldn't find a good definition. Some of the attendees in the audience might offer me one, uh, I suspect, because they've studied this too. Uh, but what I found, it's a combination of perhaps of strategy, force structure, programs, war fighting, as in programmatics, as in new weapon systems, people, a desire for change, or a desire perhaps for retrenchment. Um, so that's kind of what goes into what a CNO vision is. So I've looked at these from 1970 through 2010, the end of the first decade of uh, the 21st century. And CNO visions have been around since Admiral King's time, and we'll get into a little bit about what Admiral King's vision was. Uh, Arlie Burke, I would argue, had a very cogent and well planned vision of the future or the vision of the future for the navy he was a well-known strategic planner not so much in terms of perhaps naval strategy but long-term thinking and planning for the service uh, but after him we run into some challenges in the vietnam era with a with a trio of cnos that are perhaps spend more time fighting with secretary mcnamara than being given the chance to to execute their their vision uh, I would argue that Elmo Zumwalt, who our panelists this morning spoke about, is perhaps the first modern CNO. And I would still argue he has the most powerful, enduring vision. And we'll get into Admiral Zumwalt as we go along as well. Um, the period of the 1980s is especially interesting uh, because I think it builds upon what happens in the 1970s and you get a cogent sort of strategic period of, of calm. In the, dec in the decade of the 80s, I'll talk about that. But then in the 1990s, the idea of the CNO vision that we saw in the 80s kind of comes apart. Um, and it's due to a, some problems with, of course, the implementation of Goldwater Nichols, uh, the first Gulf War, and of course, the end of the Cold War because we don't have a Soviet opponent against which to concentrate. Um, and following the, you know, the implementation of Goldwater Nichols, especially and changes that occur, it makes it more difficult to have a good CNO vision that transcends their term, and we'll get into that. So this is the executive summary. Next slide, please. Okay, but in order to talk about 1970 to 2010, we got to talk a little bit about what happens before that. Uh, and these folks here, I think, are are essential to that effort. So first, there at the far left is Admiral Ernie King. He had a vision of a balanced fleet of carriers, battleships, cruisers, destroyers, uh, still drawn down from the very large fleet we had at the end of the Second World War. But because of budget cuts, he's ultimately unable to, to put that into full effect. But he did have an important vision in, in documents and shipbuilding plans that he endorsed. I would suggest that Admiral Forrest Sherman, as CNO, had some brilliant strategic concepts. Uh, there have been whole books written about uh, Sherman's plans for uh, the first post-World War II maritime strategy. Um, but Sherman dies, tragically, of a heart attack before he really gets a chance to put things uh, fully into effort. Admiral Arleigh Burke uh, had a very strong vision uh, for the future. His, uh, the Navy of the 1970s era, uh, the one document that he had OPNAP sign out as an actual sort of vision statement uh, is very powerful. That's the and he's the origin of the SSBN. He's the origin of nuclear and non-nuclear task forces, the Fram class, or the framing of destroyers, uh, modernization of World War II destroyers. It takes place, and he's also the originator of some innovation in Navy training, the Destroyer School, which is today uh, the Department Head School. That Jamie, did you and I? You were, we were in Department Head School together. Yeah, he sat in front of me. Uh, it's a small world here. Uh, so. Admiral Burke has a very strong vision. He has a good relationship with, with President Eisenhower, despite uh, Eisenhower's major reform efforts undertaken in the 1950s, reorganizations of 1953 and 58 that kind of defanged the CNO's ability to be an operator and makes him an administrator. Uh, Admiral Tom Moore, there on the far right, um, 
I'm going to group him in a minute with the CNOs in the 1960s, but more there's there's evidence to suggest that Moore realized that a recapitalization of the Navy was needed. Uh, Admiral Moore was no fool. He knew that the service had been worn down by consistent Vietnam deployments and that major changes needed to take place, but he just wasn't fully in a position to do that. And that requires more research. I haven't fully scratched the surface on that. I'm covering a fair amount of territory. And then finally, and, and, and certainly not insignificantly, there's Admiral Rickover, who I would argue is an alternate source of Navy vision uh, throughout his tenure in naval nuclear power. Uh, it's propulsion, it's training, uh, it's fundamentally shifting the Navy's education system toward a more STEM-based uh, approach, perhaps, and uh, a quest for excellence. And Admiral Rickover really does, I would argue, represent an alternative vision source, you know, seeking all nuclear power or mostly nuclear power for larger ships. And he's an interesting character, and we'll get into him more as well. So he's always present in the background. You always must consider Admiral Rickover and what he thinks and what he says because of the relationships that, that he has. Next slide. Okay. So the vision surge, if you want to call it this, I would argue this comes in the 1970s. Uh, Admiral Zumwalt returns to great power competition through um, his Project 60 document that some of our panelists discussed this morning. This is Admiral Zumwalt's two-month plan ahead for the Navy that, that's quite uh, comprehensive. And if you actually look at it, you can read it in uh, John Hattendorf's volume, U.S. Naval Strategy in the 1970s. A lot of what Zumwalt was doing is still present with us today. There are still um, Oliver Hazard Perry class frigates on active service. Uh, the Harpoon missile is still out there. Uh, the Captor mine sits, you know, gathering dust somewhere, but could come back. Uh, Admiral Zumwalt had a lot of programmatic uh, successes that stay with us. Uh, he was focused on sea control as opposed to power projection, trying to split those two. Uh, he's especially known for his people programs and the very public way that these were articulated as opposed to that in the past. Certainly, Admiral Burke was also interested in training the lot of the average sailor and how he could make things better, but you just don't see the same public blast of information that you see from Admiral Zumwalt. As we know, too, Zumwalt was publicly antagonistic to the Nixon administration and to Admiral Rickover. Uh, if you want to get a, a, an origin of that, read uh, Zumwalt's book on Watts, where he describes his nuclear power interview uh, with Admiral Rickover. From, from his perspective, we don't know what Admiral Rickover's was, uh, but it's quite intriguing. Okay, then there's Admiral Holloway there uh, in the middle uh, in uh, Choker White. Admiral Holloway softens Zumwalt's vision, uh, arguably, and makes it more palatable, but continues many of his programs. He's the origin of the carrier battle group concept. Uh, he certainly gets along and is very successful with Admiral Rickover. He's a nuclear trained uh, you know, engineer, as well as being a carrier aviator and commander of the Navy's first nuclear powered aircraft carrier. Uh, Admiral Holloway is known for his U.S. Navy strategic concepts. That's his sort of vision document, as well as uh, Naval Warfare Publication 1. Uh, he also becomes a bulwark against the Carter administration uh, proposed cuts to the fleet across the board, although he's best known for trying to defend aircraft carriers. Uh, but he does so in a way that you don't see anymore uh, in, in present circles, I would argue. And then finally, there's Admiral Hayward, and this is why we're grouping these admirals across the 1970s. Um, Admiral Hayward is kind of the capstone, I would argue, for the 1970s period. Uh, he commissions eventually the CNO Strategic Studies Group. Uh, he lays the groundwork uh, for some of the principles of the maritime strategy. This is happening across this decade. Uh, the origins of the 600-ship Navy, uh, which come from Sea Plan 2000, I think the actual recommended number was 585. There are a series of COAs and choices that you can choose from there, but he's the origin of that. And the other document that um, that Admiral Hayward has too is the future of U.S. Navy sea power, uh, trying to look ahead as well. So what can we say about the 1970s? It's sort of the vision surge. You're building and creating the building blocks for what becomes the maritime strategy and the 600-ship Navy. Now, each of those three CNOs has 
a vision, but they're starting to get more complementary and supportive of each other as you go across the decade. But also you have to keep in mind there's Admiral Rickover, who has close personal relationships with US presidents, members of Congress, uh, and still remains an alternate vision source. Uh, we certainly know he fought with Admiral Zumwalt, got along better with uh, Admiral Holloway, and I need to do more research to see exactly what he had to say about Admiral Hayward. Uh, but that's the 1970s. Next slide, please. All right, 1980s. And I borrowed a quote here from Peter and John Byron, who wrote an article with this title, uh, 1992, 93, 93. Make the word become the vision. So the CNO, so the word in this case is the 1980s maritime strategy and the 600 ship Navy. And this becomes kind of the de facto CNO vision across the 1980s. Now, Admiral Hayward, Admiral Watkins, and Admiral Trost approach this a little differently in each case, um, but there's kind of general agreement. The historical example to this that I would argue is the, the, the period of what they call the good Roman emperors uh, from the first century. If you go from Trajan to Marcus Aurelius, yes, each of these leaders approach the problem differently. There are disagreements, but I would argue there's remarkable continuity across the decade, at least in support of these concepts. The maritime strategy is going to change at the end of the decade and become less focused as the, on the Soviet Union as that threat starts to kind of go away. But you still have a 600 ship Navy and Admiral Trost is still campaigning for that up to his last days uh, in office. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, in the 1980s. So what happens in the 1980s? Um, oh, you know what? Go back one, please. I forgot something. The other thing that happens here is that Admiral Rickover is retired by the Reagan administration. And what that does is it means that that other source of Navy vision kind of is not quite as focused and as powerful. Admiral Rickover's legacy continues long after. And I, you can argue, I think successfully, that Rickover has a, just as powerful a vision as any CNO and is with us today in the programs that he's left and the success of the Navy's nuclear submarine force. So I would not discount that more. Next slide, please. Not really spit. Okay, so what happens in the 1990s? Uh, the vision kind of comes adrift uh, in the ten years of Admiral Kelso, Admiral Borda, and Admiral Johnson. So what happens? So you have the end of the Cold War. There's no more Soviet threat on which to focus. So the, the, the rationale for maritime strategy and the 600 ship Navy gets much harder to justify. Then you have the implementation of Goldwater Nichols and the powers of the chairman of the Joint Chiefs, where the chairman, through his use of the chairman's program estimate and the, and the chairman's heightened powers as the president's principal military advisor, uh, the chairman gets to set the tone for all the services in many ways. And General Colin Powell pictured here becomes the new alternative vision source. Uh, representative, at least in his office. Gen General Powell utilizes his powers to the fullest, and I would argue that this limits the ability of, ch of the Chief of Naval Operations to execute the kind of vision that you saw in the previous decade with the maritime strategy and the 600 ship Navy. Admiral Frank Kelso, that you see there on the left, sort of casts about for new visions and really sets a precedent for CNO visions that follow. Uh, he takes a number of stabs at this effort. There's the way ahead which is his first uh, post-Cold War look at where the Navy's going, uh, followed by the Navy policy book, which is focused again on, on people, reminiscent of some of the things that Zumwalt did. It. Some sources have called it an operator's manual for the Navy. Finally, what he settles on largely as his vision statement is the October 1992 uh, from the sea document, which articulates how the Navy is gonna support campaigns and power projections ashore, and operate in the littorals and be the supporting uh, force as opposed to being the supported force, uh, perhaps how it envisioned itself in the past, fighting battles at sea against other navies. Now the Navy is going to support other uh, services and executing their missions ashore, and uh, Navy and CNO visions are going to reflect that. And then finally, there's the first Gulf War. Uh, the Navy doesn't really get to fully demonstrate what it was doing across the 1980s in the maritime strategy. Uh, the Navy fulfills useful missions, it flies airstrikes, uh, it supports, you know, it supports uh, shore bombardment, 
Uh, it does Tomahawk cruise missile strikes, all very successful, but there's not like a, a mighty Iraqi Navy against which uh, to mobilize its, its efforts. So the idea of the CNO's vision perhaps becomes more limited. Um, and then we move on to Admiral Borda. He doesn't get a chance to articulate a vision, uh, again, due to his, uh, his tragic death. Uh, he does focus on some programs like the Arsenal ship. He's got people programs like the Seaman to Admiral program that returns under Admiral Borda. He makes some major changes to the CNO strategic study group, a uh, group of officers, Navy, Marine Corps, and Newport, uh, who in the 1980s examined elements of the maritime strategy and how to implement it operationally at sea. Uh, but he also, but Admiral Borda changes this more to a CNO directed study uh, topic for the particular year. And then we get to Admiral Johnson there uh, on the far right. Admiral Borda's suicide drives his successor, Admiral Johnson, to seek a more quiet Navy vision. The Navy's been in the public eye since the period of Admiral Kelso. You remember tail hook, uh, the USS Iowa turret explosion investigation. Uh, uh, the US Navy's faced a number of these uh, challenges and Admiral Johnson's idea of vision is to take it back more under wraps and, and more quiet. Um, and then finally, the presence of the Marines here. The Marines become another alternative sort of vision source because the Navy is linked so closely with them, especially in the From the Sea document. Uh, the Marines become a supported uh, service because they're operating directly ashore and doing the combat action. Okay, and then next slide. Okay, the 2000s and beyond, um, it starts to become all about the budget in, in many ways. You could probably argue it's always been about the budget, and that becomes OPNAP's primary focus and the CNO's uh, primary focus because the CNO is not commanding or operating forces at sea anymore after you know, both the Eisenhower reorganizations and Goldwater Nichols. Admiral Vern Clark, who follows Admiral Johnson, makes the budget central to his vision. Uh, in fact, he tells an incoming OPNAV N3, N5 uh, strategy DCNO that the Navy doesn't need a new strategy. Its strategy is the POM. So as my <laughs> colleague uh, Peter Haynes has said, the Navy at this point for formally embarks on what Peter Haynes calls a strategy of means, where it's the, the, the strategy and the vision are governed by the budget. There is some hope, though, and, and some change that, that continues through the, through the decade. Admiral Mike Mullen and Admiral Gary Ruffhead produced the two, across their terms, uh, produced the 2007 Cooperative Maritime Strategy, which is sort of a, a vision turn away from just uh, from the sea and the focus on the littorals, but still the budget uh, remains central. Uh, and what have we had since the 2000s? There have been a series of CNO visions. Directions, designs, and navigation plans that have been produced, but all, more often than not, they don't fully survive the CNO that produced them. Um, you know, there'll, there'll be a lot of work, a document will be produced, and then the new person comes in, and then you have a new document. Sometimes there's carryover, sometimes they're not. The question now is whether, whether the return of a peer competitor and the threats that they pose. Would that create another unified Navy vision across the 10 years of multiple CNO? And that remains to be seen. So uh, I look forward to your questions afterward, and thank you so very much. I'll offer a few comments uh, before we get to the questions. I promise I'll keep it quick, because uh, I expect we'll actually have quite a few questions. We have about 40 minutes from here on forward. Uh, thank you, all three of you, for your papers. Uh, they were very interesting to read beforehand and uh, very um, uh, whiplash-inducing to go from paper to paper at some points, considering <laughs> they're varying parts of relevance to what has been happening in the news. Uh, so just to go down the line uh, with the papers in the order that we read, so Captain McGrath, to start with you, I, I found it was very interesting to take a look at the battles of the early phase of the Pacific War from an operational level, not just because it's not something we usually see, but because I think it's a very useful tool, uh, especially for those who are not familiar with what the operational art is, to get a grasp of 
what's going on with that and what exactly you're supposed to do on the operational level. And I actually have already spoken to my students in my American Naval History class about what you wrote as an example of how to understand what the operational level is. At the same time, uh, that approach obviously gives us a new respect for how we can view battles that we otherwise see as a loss or a draw or as wasteful to the overall war effort. Um, my one comment I would put aside with that is that I think it would be helpful if we had a little bit more um, of, a, uh, of a bald statement, I guess, of exactly what this uh, operational procedure was in service to, as in what the overall strategic position was that Nimitz was trying to serve with that operational approach. Um, I know it's fairly self-evident, everyone in here most likely understands exactly what the situation was at that point in the Pacific War, but reading the paper as a self-contained um, entity, I think it would be extremely helpful. Um, uh, Glenn, for your paper, uh, there are many things, of course, I could say, many of which have only popped up in the last few days. Um, so I actually was most struck, though, by some of what you identified as your sub-arguments or the sub-components of your paper. And I'm specifically speaking, of course, first to your research interest, which is that special relationship, uh, the technology transfer between the United States and the Royal Navy. But more specifically, how that special relationship wasn't all that special for the first couple decades that it existed until we really got this nuclear agreement, which I believe was uh, 58 initially were the first talks. Um, and as part of that, being able to see American naval history from a different lens through that, as an Americanist myself, it's, it's very interesting to see things from that perspective and very useful to see things from that perspective. And uh, the other two things that I absolutely have to mention, or I, I'd be ashamed of myself because I, you know, it's one of those things where you're reading a paper and you get to a sentence and you're like, yes, I absolutely love this. Uh, the uselessness of the ballistic missile submarine from a sea power perspective, and yet simultaneously its criticality to uh, the prosecution of national policy, right, or national defense policy. And then, of course, at a, on a completely unrelated note, the difference between invention and innovation which was sort of shot through the whole paper. And the motivations between the United States and the Royal Navy of alternatively either seeking to um, innovate, which was to improve upon what already existed, or from the Royal Navy perspective, when they had nothing and were interested in investing in Skybolt, to invent, to break completely with the old and try something com uh, completely new. Uh, so I thought those were all really valuable in and of themselves, let alone the look that you gave us into the progression of the history of Royal Navy submarines. Um, finally, uh, Stephen, I have to admit, I'm not overly familiar with the history of what you identify as the CNO vision statements. And frankly, when I initially started reading, I thought these were concrete things that we were examining and not uh, sort of the correlation of information. Um, but the perspective you give post the uh, decline and disbandment of the general board is extremely enlightening at the very least. I, I struggled to, to find an adjective strong enough to describe how sort of the light went on in my head of now I have a better idea of how to look at Navy policy through the decades. And of course, simultaneously, as you're speaking of this gradual sort of removal of uh, reality, I guess, from the equation, because as soon as one CNO leaves, the next one comes in and kind of throws the old idea in the trash. I couldn't help but think of, of course, the election cycle, because it seems like that's constantly what we get in politics. At the same time, uh, I'm, I'm a little sad you didn't include a quote which I thought was absolutely fantastic uh, from your paper, which was, I believe, around uh, the 90s, once the peer competitor for mm -hmm. the United States disappeared. You probably already know what I'm going to say. Uh, the Cold War, um, or excuse me, the Navy uh, as detaching strategy from policy. Uh, the quote was something to the effect of uh, strategy being on the shelf for now, but could be taken down from storage if needed. Ah, uh, Kelso's confirmation. Yes, yes. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I thought that was a rather, um, uh, I guess, bold statement coming from somebody in the Navy of, even though it is true, because who do you need a, a grand strategy against? Not really something you want to say when it can get back to Congress and potentially impact your funding. Uh, nevertheless, I thought that was absolutely fantastic, a demonstration of it all being about the budget, whereas previously, of course, the budget had been a factor. There really is nothing beyond the budget, even today. We're constantly, well, less so now with the Chinese, the rise of the Chinese in the South China Sea. But even today, we are still more concerned with the budget than we are almost with anything else.
So you are welcome, of course, to respond to uh, anything I've just said, all three of you, or we can go directly to questions. It's up to the panelists. What would you like to do? I'm comfortable with questions. Questions? OK, I would like to take two questions from those here. And then as I stated at the beginning, uh, if you are a virtual attendee, there's a button in the bottom right of your Google Meet. And if you click that, it looks like three shapes of triangle, square, and circle. If you click that, there is a Q&A submission prompt there. And we will read your questions in the order we get them. So yes. Hi, um, my name is David E. Jarrett, and I work at the Naval Research Lab, and yes, I'm in the SM, a research engineer. So my question is, with respect to policy and the limitations of policy, always having the presumption of there being technological superiority on the part of the United States. In effect, you think we're hobbling ourselves in strategic thinking by always thinking, ooh, there's always a technology solution that if we just throw enough money at, we can, we can get the new gizmo, which, I mean, not to poke fun of my profession, but the new gizmo always seems to be the easier fix than trying to think deeply about necessary policy action. And so I leave the panelists. Uh, OK, no, I'll take a stab at that. Wasn't there someone, and someone will probably fill in the, the quote, the originator, Gentlemen, we're out of money. It's time to think. Um, <laughs> I'm not it's sure. Churchill. That's Churchill. Okay. Yeah, Thank you. I knew somebody here would be able to fill that in. Now, I think <laughs> that perhaps is the executive summary there is that when you're flush with money and you can afford to seek those technological solutions, uh, they're, they're always going to be part of it. Even in periods when uh, you're flush with money, there's always a technological question. Or when you don't have money, there's going to be technology involved that's going to be important. Uh, but it, it's it's not a panacea for thinking. Yeah. I, I think you're right about that. But we fall into that because technology is a thing, and it can be measured, and it has money and parameters. And I, and I think part of my major concern is looking at the last, looking at Vietnam, looking at everything but Gulf War One, where we have, where everybody knows they can't field technologically equal forces, so they're looking for ways around it, either through not. Um, Counter, uh, insurgency warfare, yeah. like means to ameliorate, if not completely ignore, the technological advantages that people like me come up with for a living. Sorry, that was. I, well, to throw that in. I think the other element of that is doctrine, right? So strategy is a key element that to determine what the national idea is or what the service idea is. But I think the other element where we need to start thinking better is in doctrine and how do we take the technologies we do have and ensure that we can use them in a manner that could maintains that advantage. And that's what the CNO was talking about at breakfast this morning, is about we need to maintain that, adva that advantage in thinking also, that, that ability to outthink our adversaries, not necessarily out, te out technology or out uh, buy or out uh, at weapon system, but out thinking our technologies. I know Glenn has been patiently waiting to chime in. So go ahead, sorry about that. Thank you very much. It's uh, opened up a hotbed of questions. First, let me say uh, uh, thank you very much for your comments and uh, the great other two papers. Um, regarding technology, may I suggest that you read a book by an author called Paul Kennedy, The Rise and Fall of the Great Powers. <laughs> he, places, he places an emphasis on technology, not just uh, America, but throughout uh, many, many uh, millennia of the great powers rise and fall and reliance on technology. And uh, linking that question actually to the first paper, the operational level, I'd say we have to differentiate in what we can call the chicken and the egg. Especially in naval matters, we have the platform and we have the system on the platform. Is it the carrier or the aircraft? Is it the missile or the submarine? Is it the Aegis destroyer or the Aegis system? And yeah, we introduce not just the doctrine, but also making sure that it's not a dogma to understand that it can only be of value if it is known how to be used. And we find, for example, already in the Gulf War 1990, we had new systems, we had new technologies, but we didn't use them because we weren't trained or we didn't know how to or we were apprehensive because they hadn't actually been proven. So I think we have to look at the bigger picture there and say operational chicken egg platform system, the value, the training, the tactical level, making sure we don't fall into dogma. Uh, 
um, just as a one sentence comment to uh, response to the last paper, Rickover was exceptional. If you're looking at 63 years of ballistic nuclear submarines, propulsion and missiles, to whom did the United Kingdom turn to in the 1950s to authorize a foreign policy decision on nuclear propulsion technology transfer. It wasn't President Eisenhower. It wasn't the Joint Chiefs of Staff. It was Admiral Rickover in 55. <clears throat> so we have to look at Rickover's role beyond that of being an admiral, and that was exceptional. Thank you. Uh, do we have any virtual questions that have come in so far? No, we don't. Not yet? Okay. Um, I, I know we have questions all over the place. Yes, go ahead in the back. Uh, so two, really, and I'll keep them very brief, but two quick comments, uh, one each for, for Steve and one for Jamie. Um, for Steve, I think, and I say this in the collective we, I really did like the way you framed Rickover as a sort of source of alternative vision. And I think as we start to, to write historiography of the 20th century naval strategy, I think it's important that we not forget the role of Sobrowski. And, and the fact that he, to, to a much lesser extent than Rickover for sure, but in terms of, if you look at the composition of the United States Navy battlefleet as we have it today, LMBS, and the Mole class, I think it's hard to mistake that, that Sobrowski, to varying degrees, shaped the fleet that we have and the fleet that we'll, we'll have to deal with for, for at least the foreseeable future. Uh, so that's just one quick comment. I'd be curious to hear your thoughts on that. Um, and then for Jamie, he knew it was coming. Here it is. I waited until John arrives so John can defend you. Uh, <laughs> operational art is a fabrication of the army, and, and it's, it's derived from an inability to actually read 19th century questions. <laughs> okay. Uh, no, you can tell me I'm wrong. I'm just going to go with noted, but thank you. No, I, 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 Steve, you want to go ahead and answer your question first? Uh, yeah, all my, all my war college slides start with U.S. Army for operational art. Too, uh, yeah. um, <laughs> So, so Admiral Sobrowski is another vision center, perhaps. Again, I've kind of scratched the surface with this, and I think there's a lot more work to do in trying to explore CNO visions uh, themselves. But uh, I've heard both. I've heard people say that you know Admiral Sobrowski was you know a genius, and he drove all these different things and all these different lines of thinking. He's also a CNO Strategic Studies Group alum, uh, and that's uh, and that's what they got into the business of doing as well. Um, but after Admiral Sobrowski, his tenure is much shorter. Had he hung around, you know, sadly he passed away very young. Uh, maybe had he hung around with the same length that Admiral Rickover did, he may have had more of an impact. Um, and what you, what you find in, in places like OpNav and others is much of it is personality driven. And a, person, a strong personality can create something, like Admiral Sobrowski's Office of Force Transformation. But after he was gone, they got moved to smaller and smaller quarters and off the you know, and into hideaways. So you've got to get into the institution to really have influence. So that's why the, I like the POM. The POM is institutional. It's fundamental to what the organization does. If you can't break that lock and get in, uh, and Tom Hone may disagree with me, he's really the expert here on this, uh, in looking at, the, at looking at OpNav as an institution. But if you can get in there on an institutional level with what you're doing in, in your vision, then you're successful. Yes, in the back. I have a, a quick question for you, Steve. Um, in terms of building a vision or being a CNO who can uh, build a strategy or something that sticks, how much, how difficult is that to do with the Navy being as decentralized as it is? And in terms of going forward, I know there's conversations today that the Navy needs a new strategy. Can't just be calm and budget, consumed with the budget, consumed with the bond, consumed with the platform, and needs a strategy to, to link all of that to. How hard would it be today to have a vision or a strategy as a CNO with how decentralized even strategy shops are today? I mean, there are no strategy shops in, as they were in the 80s, the 70s and 80s, where you had, had all sorts of 
one location. I just wanted to see what you thought about the structure of the Navy itself. Well, ah, well, even even fun. in the uh, yeah, there there is a strategy shop. There there, well, there is. There is. Right. Yeah, they, 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 they are. Right? <laughs> <laughs> I know there's a strategy shop. I'm sorry, no, no, that's not right. Well, You're right. There are, there are several strategy shops, or even or or groups of people in one location thinking as there were, in, as you talk about in your book. Oh yes. You know you know. Or am I wrong? I mean, no, no. Um, it, it depends on how you manage it. Uh, if, if you've read my book, I talk a lot about sort of what I call long-term competition within the OpNav office between uh, the folks who are in Op 603, the Navy Strategy Shop, represented here by Peter, and the folks in Op 96 and 965, represented by Tom, and perhaps you were, were you, did you work for 965, right? As a consultant. As a consultant, okay. So, they're in some ways two sides of the same coin, but different Navy leaders are able to were able to mobilize the success of both and not allow them to to bash heads uh, too much. Uh, Admiral Crow, when he was a very junior officer, when he he created Peter Admiral Crow created your Op six hundred three. Yeah, that's what I thought. Okay, Admiral Crow creates Op six hundred three, but then if you read articles by Wayne Hughes, who's a charter member of the Op nine six nine six five organization. He will say how Admiral Crow worked very hard to smooth relations between the two and help to coordinate their efforts. Uh, if doc, Dr. Dave Rosenberg was here, he'd talk about that probably too. So there's competition that can be managed, but you just don't want to let it get destructive within your own organization. You're right, that's decentralized. It was then. Uh, it's not so decentralized now. Uh, you've read the book. Uh, I would argue that uh, strategy doesn't get the same level of interest that it did. It's become more about the budget um, because that's institutional. In the 1980s, the strategy had become more institutional. You had successive versions of the 1980s maritime strategy that made that possible. Um, the changes I talked about in this brief are, are part of it too. Goldwater Nichols makes it even harder for a service to create a strategy. Uh, the Army and the Air Force look at the Navy and say, why are you guys writing a strategy? You know, you're a service. You're supposed to, like, provide forces. But the Navy fundamentally doesn't see itself that way. Even with 30 years of Goldwater Nichols, a ship captain still gets underway, and when once they're out of sight of land, he or she is doing their thing, you know. So there's still that. Um, so it's it's harder structurally. I think you could you could do it, but you'd have to overcome a lot of, disapproval uh, because people will say, well, Goldwater Nichols says we're supposed to be joint. You're Navy being parochial and not being a, a team player again. Right. You're, you're off on your own thing. Uh, a good book to read is, is Admiral J.C. Wiley's book, uh, Theory of Power Control, where he writes why a sailor thinks like a sailor as opposed to why an Army person or an Air Force person thinks the way they do. And I think some of those things still linger. So that's probably an incomplete answer and I don't want to spend a whole lecture on it. We can talk about it more afterwards, <laughs> certainly. But I think that's a good question. I think there's some challenges. I know we have a bunch of people over here I haven't managed to get to yet. So yes. Okay, I found actually a State Department faculty of National Law College. So uh, thank you for all the briefs. So Jamie, a question that at the expression goes, you know, war shapes strategy more than strategy shapes war. Okay. So that's Pearl Harp, the argument to be made to the United States was prepared for decisive foot battles, but then once we lost those assets, our strategy had to change. Mm -hmm. So I'm interested if you think that's accurate. And so your insights into how the Navy managed that shift, uh, the new paradigm shift, if you use the cliche. But if, if it was that big of a shift, has the Navy internally, which had been structured, oriented in one direction, suddenly switched on a dime to do something else? That leads into a question for Steve as well in terms of how does the Navy change? So you have another great power competitor. Is the only impediment to a CNO's vision uh, for Goldwater Okay, well, I, I would say that yes, the Navy did have to fundamentally change its structure, and it did so over a period of a probably two years. Uh, it took some, some failures uh, to recognize, but I think one of the key elements that having Admiral Nimitz in that place, he was visionary enough to recognize what he had at hand and recognize that he didn't have a battle line anymore, so he had to do with what he had. And so he developed fairly quickly things that those assets could do. Uh, an area that I didn't discuss in here would be the carrier and surface raids that occurred in the first two months of the war, January, February timeframe. Uh, 
Um, it's uh, something that the Naval War College actually was looking at in the 1940s called Operations in Uncommanded Seas. So he was using the assets he had operating in that gray zone middle where he wasn't necessarily contesting for sea control, wasn't trying to gain sea control, but also recognized the Japanese weren't able to operate in that area. So I think what the, the, one of the key things is Nimitz's quick realization that he didn't have the battle fleet anymore, the through ticket, which had already been discounted as a primary strategy anyway, um, wasn't going to be where they were going. And so he didn't necessarily shift strategy so much as he shifted the tactics that went with the, the vessels that he had to use. And this is, I'm going to kind of answer uh, Nick's question a little bit. This is where I see, whether you call it operational art or whatever, that middle space between strategy, which was the U.S. Pacific Fleet being, a, it was it was the uh, Europe first was the national strategy. So that relegated the Pacific to a secondary fleet or a secondary uh, area, uh, oper area of operations. Um, brought the uh, forced Nimitz to say, okay, I've got to do with what I have. And then the, he, the, the tactics were then developed slowly, um, but the tactics were then developed. And the idea of stringing those tactical actions together to start pushing towards that objective of eventually defeating the Japanese, but using a, a, a second fleet or a, se or, sorry, a second uh, theater type idea um, was what he ended up doing. So I think that's positive. Um, other impediments to Castino vision and strategy. I think Admiral Kelso was probably right in retrospect, when he said that in order to, Kelso said this in response to a, to a question from then very junior Senator John McCain about the future of naval strategy. Uh, and Kelso said, I think something like this, and Paul GR will correct me because uh, I never get the quote exactly right, and he knows it by heart, you see, because he was sitting there taking notes. Uh, and he said, Kelso said, I think in order to, to have a strategy, you need an enemy. And we don't have an enemy anymore, so we need a policy. And that, and, and Admiral Kelso was as big a supporter of maritime strategy, you know, in the 1980s as, as anybody else. So I think with the demise of the Soviet Union, the fact that our strategy was so focused on just those opponents that it was inevitable there's going to be a change. So the fact that we have opponents again might help us, that might help think, overcome the impediment. Uh, Goldwater Nichols is, a, is an impediment structurally. But having opponents again can certainly help. Uh, but maybe the lesson we take from maritime from the from Goldwater from the uh, what am I saying? Maybe the lesson we take from 1990, 1991, and what Kelso had to say is we don't wholly focus the strategy only on those two opponents. It has to be about the opponents, but we have to keep in mind some broader vision, and that's harder because we're all about war fighting. Um, but Goldwater Nichols is going to be a challenge. Although you start to see some members of Congress suggest that it's time for a change. Former devil of mine, Elaine Luria, doing that. <laughs> yeah, it's a small world. Yeah. Go ahead, Glenn. Yeah, thank you. I'd just like to, in terms both of structure and um, yeah. operational level and as well as technology, say that, yes, when you don't have an enemy, you have an issue. And you look very much in terms of gunboat diplomacy. You're projecting uh, power mm -hmm. through presence. And when you do have an enemy, you have to think about things of keeping the sea routes open. And that might be piracy. So there's a lot to be learned about terrorist piracy, whether it's of uh, Somalia or whether it is migration, for example, in the Mediterranean, uh, illegal trafficking, both in the Car Caribbean area and in the Mediterranean. And you also have to look at things which we haven't looked at for many, many decades called choke points and how to keep the choke points open. And yeah, in terms of, once again, looking both at structure and technology, we potentially have a problem because none of our Cold War enemies and currently, but potentially in the future, have had a deep blue water capability to go beyond very much no more than their littoral zone. And if they did, what would our ability be to keep the sea routes open, to keep the choke points open when what is facing us is a missile? So what kind of fleet do we need which is stealth and which has anti-missile capability? And in terms of structure, we then have to think about, yes, things which have been looked at uh, for more than 100 years, land, air, we don't really have 
very much in depth in that. We rely very much on aircraft carriers to think about sea air. But in a longer term thinking plan, we might have to rethink a lot of things if we do have an adversary on the three levels. Gunboat diplomacy, keeping the sea routes open, and the choke points where we are actually potentially in the enemy territory. Thank you. Anything? Yeah, I just want to keep on top of that. So I promised Captain Paraboo he could go next. An observation. Remember that in the Army, you can't do something unless somebody tells you you can. In the Navy, you can do something unless somebody tells you that you can. And it's always a good thing to keep in mind. I was going to ask about the CNO vision. How much dependency did you notice on the community from which they come? The submariners, whoever came on Holloway and the, the, the crowd that was, they, they were either aviators who were also nuclear submariners, heavily influenced by Admiral Rickover, or surface warfare officers who were always kind of, how'd they get in here? <laughs> and and did you, do you notice that in the, in the vision? Or whatever. I, I think you do at certain points, certainly. Uh, there are a lot of folks who would probably say that Admiral Zumwalt, because he was a surface officer, he hadn't had a major fleet command, uh, he hadn't commanded a carrier battle group or something like that. He had one kind of vision. I think he was a crew des group commander, cruiser destroyer group. Um, so that he brought with him this sea control vision as opposed to thinking about sea control and power projection as two sides of the same coin, which I think is more of what perhaps Admiral Holloway thought of and the folks of the maritime strategy era, you know, they, the two go together. Um, so I think, I think that makes sense. Um, I don't know beyond, beyond that. Certainly when you get into the two thousands and you get surface warfare officers, uh, as, uh, the CNOs, when you get, um, Admiral uh, Borda and Admiral Roughhead, and eventually you get to the 2007 cooperative maritime strategy that talks about ships and, sea lanes that's kind of ship focused um but that has also a lot to do with uh, the situation at the time there's not a submarine threat so i guess i haven't fully scratched that and that would be worth more exploration is does your community source affect your vision and that that's an important observation and i should take that into account go ahead yeah um yeah i'm tom home i'm 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 kind of the the bad apple in this group because I, <laughs> I worked for uh, Vice Admiral Arthur Sobrowski, retired as part of the Office of Force Transformation. And I just want to say something about a vision. He had a vision, an extraordinary vision. In my opinion, he had great difficulty getting the rest of us to share it and to see it in the first place so that we could share it. He and I didn't get along about that. Um, he hired me in protest. Uh, he said, you know the PBBS system, and that's a bad thing. That's, that kills vision. That's what he said. It kills vision. Um, and you, you come out of that community. So I really don't want you here. <laughs> <laughs> At least he was honest, right? <laughs> well, he was wonderfully honest. And he said, but you have to be here because you know the enemy. And I need to know the enemy. And he was struggling with how to... Uh, insert again, it, it didn't matter what service you're talking about, but, but a, a, the notion of vision itself went into vision. He said maritime strategy had a vision, which was the Navy could be instrumental in ending the Cold War. The vision was to end the Cold War. And his concern in, in this century, in the early years of this century, 02, 03, was there was no vision about the future. It was, there was one, it's sort of globalization, right? And everybody's going to look like the United States. And I won't tell you how he felt about that, but you can imagine how he did feel about that. And, um, and, and he saw it as essentially a materialist vision. And he was a devout Catholic. So, you know, materialism was not enough for his life. So one of the things I want to suggest is that Having a vision is one thing. Communicating it is incredibly difficult. Yes. And you know, I would talk about that sometimes with reference to stories from the Bible. Um, we were an odd 
couple. <laughs> <laughs> I was a devout Catholic, and I come from the very lowest orders of Protestantism. And and so we had, yeah, so we had very you know very different. But we we actually got to discussions about how you develop and communicate a vision by talking about religious things. Isn't that interesting? That is a vision. Yeah, mm -hmm. and, 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 you know because that was what religion was to him. It was an all-embracing vision, as it had been for me. So we, we found ourselves disagreeing about particular things, and then sliding over into this business of vision. And I had no, no idea what to do with it. So I'm, I'm just talking about a failure on my part. I didn't know how to turn that into something that he could then turn around and present to the Navy, and Navy people say, OK, we like this, we'll run with it. So. Did I miss a question over here? You didn't have your hand up, did you? I did. Before, because I'm sorry, it's difficult to see around the podium. Go ahead. I mean, that may have been on purpose on my part. <laughs> um, yeah, hi, uh, Diana Weger. Um, I'm with the, at the University of Chicago and also at the Naval Post Graduate School, um, the Faculty of Research. I don't know. Um, I have kind of a couple sort of scattershot questions um, that may or may sort of not sort of touch on a couple different um, uh, papers. Um, I think first, I, I really like the point about um, very explicitly stating in, in Glenn's paper, or he did, um, that national security is the priority of, of the SSDN fleet, right? It's not about sea power, it doesn't really actually do anything for that. Um, and I'm kind of curious about how um, how, the US, how the UK thinks about um, the SSDN fleet within sort of the, the budgeting process, as we've been talking about, sort of within this vision. Um, does the SSBN fleet, in fact, actually decrease the Royal Navy's ability to project sea power because it is drawing resources away? Um, or do they sort of set up a separate, you know, this may be a little more technical, but do they have sort of a separate line of funding that's sort of like, oh, this is for national defense, this comes out of this set, and we also are going to do just as much sea power as before? Um, and I think similarly, actually, sort of within the, the U.S. context, um, you know, kind of how does that get, get thought about? Um, kind of within this big mission set and trying to understand the vision for what the Navy can do and is capable of doing and should be doing. Um, another question that I lost. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> Who wants to tackle that one? Well, it sounds like Glenn. Sounds like <laughs> go ahead, Glenn. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, very interesting question. And we have to look at a different uh, government or uh, parliamentary system of budget approvals and voting, as well as a different procurement system. Uh, the United Kingdom's Parliament, the House of Commons, votes on an annual defense budget. And believe it or not, the 1982 Falklands War fell within that year's budget when canceled uh, training. So there was no nothing, no budget overrun for 1982 even. Took <laughs> credit for the war. <laughs> indeed, indeed. The credit for, for the Navy, which managed to austerely use container ships with carriers instead of aircraft carriers. From the point of procurement, which goes hand in hand with um, budget approvals, procurement first of all looks at when a system has ended its life or is about to end its life, will it be have an update or replacement? That goes hand in hand with an evaluation of technology. Is there something new which could replace a system which is currently in service because it's outdated technology? And thirdly, what does the enemy possess? When you're looking at SSBN, it was very easy. Uh, the lifespan of both the platform, the submarine, as well as the missile, we're talking decades. So the need to actually go through a budget approval vote is maybe once in a lifetime for anybody serving in parliament, or in fact, for anybody in the Navy. The Tridents, which are currently in service, were approved by Thatcher in 1982, and they will be in service till 2028. It does not distract from other systems. We have recently, in the Royal Navy, introduced two new aircraft carriers the uh, Queen Elizabeth aircraft carrier type class, of which one is the Queen Elizabeth II and one Prince Charles. And we've introduced new aircraft, the F-35 B and C, for those aircraft carriers. Mm 
So in other words, and the fourth generation of nuclear submarines have been improved for procurement from 2028 onwards. It takes up to 10 years sometimes to build a submarine. So if we look at the grand picture, we find that uh, a system to be cancelled is harder than for a system's replacement to be approved. Uh, I hope that uh, gives you, without getting into a long lecture, I hope that gives you an indication of how procurement and decision-making works on budget in the United Kingdom. All right, I need to take one from over here. So, yes, sir. Um, so, ter terrific brief by everyone. Uh, Hunter Stark, by the way, fellow at um, the Hatton Center at the War College, and I am now diving heads headlong into the Palm business because I'm now a uh, program analyst at N957. So, um, question for Dr. Wills. So, or to, sort of two questions. One is, um, have you did you consider how do you consider or could you speak to the role of the the service secretary, and if you want you to include the other civilian secretaries, you know, the defense secretary of defense, et cetera, in terms of uh, providing either a complementary, a, a rival, or a an amplifying or sustaining source of vision for the Navy and for, uh, you know, more broadly. Um, so I'm thinking, you know, the part where you look at the, and the, the, the period of the good emperors, that is mm -hmm. very much the period of John Lehman. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. And then, uh, and potentially other other you know civilian secretaries who are relevant in your in that analysis, kind of overlapping over the different CNOs. And then, um, could I hazard to ask you to assess the or extend your analysis to play the three most recent CNOs? So you know, Greener, um, Richardson, and Gilda in the continuity versus change there. Thank you. Ooh, okay. Um, <laughs> well, well, first of all, um, I, I would agree with, with Tom, who made the assessment in his book, I think, uh, that it's Forrestal and Lehman are these forceful personalities that insert themselves in as, as SECNAVs into processes and help develop a vision. Um, We'll get to him. Uh, we'll get to them too. Well, certainly, as as the Navy Secretary, uh, James Forrestal had a vision, I think, of where the Navy ought to go, and he's forward and inserts himself into the into the process. Um, having the Secretary is key, though, on board because, as I've argued in my book, um, and Peter said this, you know. The maritime strategy has many fathers and mothers and people who worked on it and did stuff to it, and all contributing at various points. I would argue John Lehman's great contribution to this is he's kind of the, the secret sauce. Uh, without having someone who knows this community as the Navy secretary, it's much, he made it easy to connect it to the Reagan administration. Okay, so he's he's been a naval analyst in the 1970s in varying degrees. Um, he becomes the secretary. He at least knows the battle space. He knows what's been talked about, and he can advance it and connect it to a wider presidential administration. Having the president on board matters. Um, there's a great quote that I borrowed from Dub Zakheim, uh, who worked in uh, worked for uh, Secretary Rumsfeld, worked for President Reagan different times. Uh, he relates that he was sitting in a room full of people where Gene Kirkpatrick is addressing the audience, and President Reagan interrupts her which apparently no one ever interrupted Gene Kirkpatrick, ever, not even the President of the United States. And Reagan turns and says something like, I understand that there are people here that don't support the 15-carrier Navy, 600-ship Navy. Well, I do. Are there any questions? <laughs> something like that. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, and you yeah, really yeah. that president? <laughs> the mask helps, or maybe it doesn't. The important point is that having the President of the United States on board matters. Having a Navy secretary who is a political appointee, who's connected to the president that they work for, being able to connect whatever is cooking within OPNAV and other places in terms of strategy, and then connecting it to the presidential administration, because that's what really powers it forward. And certainly no one can argue that you know the, the maritime strategy and the 600-ship Navy were powered in many ways by the Reagan administration. Uh, so that's that answer. Um, the last three CNOs. Uh, that gets into my day job uh, more. <laughs> you know, I work for these um, people, so anything I have to say has nothing to do with, it reflects only my own opinion and not that of the United States Navy or the Center for Naval Analysis. 
Um, as, I, as I kind of hinted to, I think the, the CNO visions in general have become more stovepipe and not connected to a wider effort. Uh, I can be critical about that, but at the same time, what do you unite around? And look at the CNO. The CNO is a build, train, and equip person. Now, they're, they're not, they've, they've done, there have been forays towards strategy again, but ultimately it's about producing that budget to produce the forces that the operational commanders need to have. So, you know, what vision do you have as that sort of chief executive officer? And really it becomes about the programs. The other enduring vision in the Navy since 2003 is the 30 year shipbuilding plan. Again, created by Admiral Clark, picked up by Congress because they liked it so much and thought it was such a great tool. It's become institutionalized. So your ticket to success, if you're seeking to influence this great structure called the United States Naval Forces, US Navy, US Marine Corps, is to put something into the institution that it can't get rid of. You know, some sort of document or reoccurring thing or something Congress demands every year. You know, we have those in-serve reports that some of the Navy say, oh, I don't like those, maybe I ought to classify them again. Uh-uh, Congress wants those. They're institutionalized within the service. So that's your ticket to success. Whatever the case is, is working something into the institution so it has to stay. But we are unfortunately with that out of time. So thank you to our three panelists. Thank you. I apologize for those of you who didn't get to. Uh, please hang around. Do me if favor. You want to talk. I'd love to see the paper if you are willing to share it. Uh, thank you, Glenn. Thank you. Wiley. And I